Welcome to tonight's formal meeting. We continue to host hybrid meetings to keep everyone healthy and safe. Our meetings are public and you are welcome to join us in person or by watching from the Council's agenda page, Facebook, YouTube, or SLC TV. Please continue to join us whenever, in whichever manner you feel uh, most comfortable. And let's uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, and uh, welcome to the, and the uh, public meeting rules. Thank you again for everyone for joining us tonight. If you'd like to give uh, public comments today, we are accepting comments in person and online on WebEx. If you're wearing a mask, feel free to remove it once you get called to address the council from the podium. Thank you again for participating today. Before we begin moving through the, our agenda, I want to mention and review our rules of decorum. The City Council has always had guidelines in place to ensure our meetings are orderly, civil, and efficient. The guidelines help everyone feel comfortable sharing their comments without feeling intimidated. To achieve this, our rules of decorum take effect the moment you arrive. We respect all points of view and welcome new insights. Please be respectful while sharing your comments. Avoid yelling, using profanity, making racial slurs, or obscene or defamatory remarks. If you violate this rule, we will mute your line or, you will, or we'll ask you to stop. If you feel the need to use such language to express your opinions, you may email council members or leave a message on our 24-hour comment line. Additionally, our staff will request your name during the WebEx registration process. To limit disruptions, your name cannot include a message or violate our rules of decorum. If your name doesn't apply, comply, our staff will let you know. And for, the, for those joining on WebEx, please watch your chat window in case uh, we try to reach you. Isaac Caneda Caneto from our staff will moderate our WebEx and will message you with any questions about your registration. Staff is handling many tasks, so please limit messages to technical issues and minimal information updates. If you'd like to send a comment, Please feel free to mail us at P.O. Box 145-476, Salt Lake City, 84114, emailing us at council.comments at slcgov.com, or call our number 801-535-7654. Next is item A4. Council will approve the work session minute meeting minutes of November 10th, 2022, as well as a formal meeting minutes of October 18th, 2022. I look for a motion. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Fowler, second from Councilmember Wharton. See no discussion on this item. My roll call is Councilmember Bala Morris. Yes. Wharton. Yes. Fowler. Yes. Bui. Mono? Yes. And Mono? He may not be able to. He may not be connected at this time. So that motion passes five to zero with Council Member Mono and Pietro absent. We're moving on to item B, which is our public hearings. We will now begin our public hearing process. Taylor Hill and her staff will be calling the names of those who wish to comment. We will call names on of people on WebEx and in person based on the order of registration or received comment cards. Once we open the public comments, Taylor will announce three names at a time so people can have some uh, notice to prepare to speak. When it's your turn to speak, Taylor will announce your name. If you are on WebEx, your line will be unmuted and you will be, may begin. If you are here in person, please step up to the podium to make your comments once Taylor announces your name. To begin, state your name and your two-minute timer will start. The two-minute mark, the staff will announce time. If you're unable to finish your comments, please send your rest of it via email, mail, or call our office. If you no longer wish to speak, please either message our staff, or when staff states your name, just let us know that you're here to listen. And our first public hearing, item B1, is in regards of the rezone master plan amendment and valley vacation at 1550 South Main Street Assemblage. And before we take the comments, I'm going to turn the time over to uh, Brian Fulmer, 
uh, Council Staff Policy Analyst to give a short introduction. And Brian, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a proposal to amend the zoning map for properties at 1518, 1530, 1540, and 1640. 5 South Main Street, as well as 1515 South Richard Street from the current Corridor Commercial District and R15000, which is single family residential designations, to FBUN2 or form based urban neighborhood district. A request to vacate a city owned alley adjacent to the properties is also included. It should be noted the proposal originally included amending the Central Community Master Plan future land use map, but that is no longer included because the recently adopted ballpark station area plan supersedes the Central Community Plan for this area. That is my introduction. Thank you, Brian. And Taylor, please, our uh, first public comment. Thank you, Council Chair. It looks like there are eight people here to speak to this item. The first will be Lance Spencer, followed by Jason Schultz, and then Amy Hawkins. Lance, you are unmuted. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I was having some issues earlier. Yeah, I, I just have some general support for um, rezoning in a way that allows for more density, for more housing, for mixed use, that will maximize the potential of the city. And so, um, is someone interested in um, the city growing um, to its full potential over time? I would just like to voice uh, support for um, getting zoning restrictions out of the way and allow you know the citizens and uh, companies of Salt Lake City to um, develop uh, the property that we have to the maximum extent. Um, and so. Um, I don't know that this particular issue is all that controversial relative to other rezoning proposals, but um, I feel like too uh, too often we only hear the negative voices and not people who just generally want to see more economic opportunity, more opportunity for homes, and more opportunity for us to um, take advantage of the you know limited property that, that we have, just physically speaking. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Jason Schultz, followed by Amy Hawkins and then Cindy Cromer. Jason, you are unmuted. Hey, thanks so much. <clears throat> so I'm a neighbor. I live um, just up the street from this project. <clears throat> and I second um, a lot of what the previous speaker was saying. Uh, I, too, am um, in support of uh, affordable housing, um, housing for our city. Um, I do differ, however, I'm a little bit worried about, or I'm, I'm very concerned about this project um, based on the size and where it's located. Um, I am especially concerned about the lack of setbacks, um, both on Main Street and Kensington. Um, I hope that the city council members have walked Kingsington um, and imagined the, the sidewalks are, are very, very, very small there. And the thought of having um, a, a, a large um, building coming right off of that sidewalk, I think would really diminish the walkability of the neighborhood that already struggles with a lot of walkability issues. So I am pro-development, um, but I think that we need to be really careful and I think that um, the city council's adoption of the um, uh, master plan um, does seem to be in contradiction with parts of this um, rezone, uh, especially for this specific location. Um, <clears throat> if this rezone does go forth, um, I really think that we need to formalize um, real guidelines around uh, having green space and then um, having uh, specific guidelines tied to the project around the activated ground floor um, commercial space that I think the, the current developers have said they're going to do, but there's no um, binding agreement that they're actually going to do that. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Next will be Amy Hawkins, followed by Cindy Cromer, and then Sash Combs. Amy is here in person to speak. Uh, 
I'm Jeff Sandstrom. I'm swapping places with Amy. Uh, my name's Jeff Sandstrom, a ballpark community council board member and homeowner to the north of the proposed Main Street assemblage at 1496 South Main is my home address. I'm excited about and in full support of the redevelopment of this location and in support of the alley closure. My request to the council is to consider whether the redevelopment and zoning proposal are in harmony with the recently adopted ballpark station area plan which we spent years on as a community. On page 13 of the station area plan that uh, the new development uh, section uh, says in uh, the Main Street character area should focus on maintaining the scale, walkability, bikeability of the neighborhood. On page 18 of the station area plan, it states that the future land use in the Main Street area between Kensington Avenue and 1700 South should be considered for redevelopment into a medium density area that utilizes current building scale and massing to guide future development. The building in this area should be considered for redevelopment no, call, no taller than three stories with front doors on Main Street, stoops and yards. Um, I want to focus on uh, the last comment, stoops and yards. If you look at the various properties on the west side of Main Street from 1300 to 1700 South, there are 35 different parcels. None of these 35 are built up to the sidewalk except the old storefront at 1700 South and Main. All recent new development in the area, such as the 15 main townhomes at 1499 South Main Street and the Moda on Main townhomes at 1570 South, have uh, they've all complied with the height, size, scale, and setbacks as commercial corridor zoning required. Um, they're also compatible with the station area plan. We've appreciated Time. these. Okay. Next will be Cindy Cromer, followed by Sash Combs, and then Amy Hawkins. Hi there. I'm Cindy Cromer. I want to bring two issues to your attention. The first is that you cannot use density bonuses to promote housing for lower income residents if you give away density in the form of higher density zoning. The filing fee for a rezone is less than trivial compared to the increased value of the land. Secondly, I believe there are two issues with public process in this request. First, a substantial number of residents showed up at the Planning Commission hearing. They were well informed and articulate. Their input was relevant both to a zoning change and then, at that time, a master plan amendment. Their comments were ignored. And the commission also ignored the residents near the rezoning and master plan amendment at 865 South, 500 East, recently. It is not equitable when you're talking about the largest investment a family can make, um, their home, to make these changes without considering their input. This afternoon, I sent you a memo regarding t development agreements and the need to address potential development agreements at the beginning of the public process. I was admittedly stunned to learn that during the pandemic, the state legislature made changes to LUDMA, which are friendly to a better public process. The staff report from planning does raise the possibility of a development agreement without any specifics. You may consider a development agreement as you have so often in the past. One is certainly necessary with the FBU and two when the surrounding zoning is not form based and has been in place for 27 years. There is no question that the FBU and two is a blank check for developers. There is no question that a development agreement could make this project less bad. But the process hasn't included one, and the argument in the memo is that you cannot add one now without sending the proposed development agreement back through the process. I realize that this summary is contrary to what you have been doing in the past. It is also contrary to how I think about the state legislature. Hi. Thank you very much. Next will be Sash Combs, followed by Amy Hawkins, and then Josh Blankenship. Sash is here in person. Uh, hello, I'm Sash Combs. I'm a resident, uh, kind of a stone's throw away uh, in front of the uh, city 
utilities building. That's where I live on uh, 1531 South. So <clears throat> I'd like to say that uh, first I am excited to hear about the development of this site. Uh, I support the, the alley vacation and generally the rezoning of the residential lot to match the other and the consolidation. What I do oppose, however, is this rezone to FBUN2. I don't think it's necessary. Um, and uh, th my first issue is just the lack of the, the uh, requirement for setback. Um, in the working session a couple weeks ago, uh, the petitioner used the term urban wall to describe this rezoning or uh, their vision for the site. They've also showed some concepts of this, this urban wall. Um, frankly, I just don't think that remotely fits in with the fabric of the neighborhood. Um, and it's absolutely incompatible with the recently adopted station area plan. Um, so I challenge the council to think about this urban wall or, or in that setting or think about it at 9th and 9th or in, in Sugar House. Did, does the urban wall fit? Does it make it walkable? Um, I, I don't think it does. I really don't think it does. Um, it, particularly on Kensington or Andrew or whatever you want to call it. It's those two streets are right there on the, the north aspect of that. Um, the second point is just the precedence this sets. Uh, this is the first uh, kind of petition post um, ballpark stationary plan and um, you know it's contrary to that plan and I don't understand like how we can move forward with that. If the CC is outdated, let's update that. We got to get this right. I don't believe these guys have met the threshold to rezone this to this FBUN2. Um, they can do what they need to do in the commercial corridor. If commercial Time. corridor is wrong, let's fix that. Thanks. Next will be Amy Hawkins, followed by Josh Blankenship, and then Dave Ilvis. Amy is here in person. Hello, council members. I'm Amy J. Hawkins. I'm chair of the Ballpark Community Council. I also served as a member of the Ballpark Station Area Plan, bless you, steering committee. I'd like to build off of what my neighbors have said. We are really excited about the possibility of redevelopment in this space. But I want to reiterate what Jeff and the Ballpark Station Area Plan have to say about the value of stoops and yards. Oh my gosh, why do we care about setbacks? Because of how little green space we have in Ballpark, except for the ballpark itself, which is great, but you have to pay to get into it. Council members, you've been briefed on drafts of Salt Lake City's Urban Forest Action Plan. Data in that plan show that Ballpark consistently ranks in the city's category with the lowest percentage of tree canopy coverage and correspondingly the highest surface temperatures. We need some place to put the trees to put up an equitable tree canopy. We need some setbacks. We also know that according to the public lands needs assessment, Ballpark is identified as a high need area with 2.8 park acres per 1,000 people compared to the citywide level of 3.5 park acres. Any further reduction in our neighborhood's green space would not serve the public interest. Front and side yards are meaningful parts of green space. Why would we set ourselves up by eliminating any opportunities to put in trees and vegetation and potentially reduce Ballpark's urban heat island effect? Without being contingent on a site plan or a development agreement, a developer may do as a developer did at Central 9th at the former Henry's Dry Cleaner site. Apply for a rezone to Form Base 2, get it, and then sell the property to another developer whose ground floor plans include parking and a leasing office, which I hope we can all agree is not meaningful activation of ground floor space. If you choose to rezone, please add stipulations or development agreement to maintain our setbacks or Hi. activate commercial space in a meaningful way. Thank you. Next will be Josh Blinkenship, followed by Dave Ildis. Josh, you are unmuted. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm also a resident in the ballpark neighborhood. I live directly across from the proposed site. And I would just like to follow up with what Amy was just talking about with some uh, research that was in a letter that we submitted to the um, Planning Commission, um, but I'm not quite sure it got forwarded to the City Council. So um, I would like to talk about why front and side yards are actually an important part of green space 
especially where we don't have much green space to begin with. Peer-reviewed academic research suggests that front yard space are the most important spaces for neighbors to socialize and community build. For example, in importance of the residential front yard for social sustainability, comparing sense of community levels in semi-private public open spaces, published in the Journal of Green Building, front yards were rated as the most important out of 13 possible choices in response to the question, in, in comfortable weather conditions, in which outdoor spaces do you most get to know other people within your neighborhood? The study concludes that front yards act as important semi-private public spaces where people enjoy social interactions, identity creation, and the development of a sense of community. Given the high level of renter-occupied properties in the ballpark neighborhood, 85% compared to 15% of owner-occupied properties, and new residents moving in, there is a high degree of resident turnover. Forming long-lasting social bonds between neighbors can be challenging. Providing opportunities to develop a sense of community is very important to invested neighborhood residents. And in no way do we want to endorse reducing the physical space in the ballpark neighborhood where those interactions can happen. Thank you very much. And I am also so in support of development of this property. Thanks. And next will be Dave Ildis, who is here in person to speak. Hi, my name is Dave Iltis. Um, just had a couple of thoughts on this. One is you're doing another alley vacation. And there's no alley master plan for Salt Lake City, and yet you keep doing this over and over. The council keeps approving these sorts of things, and the administration has no plan. They had some sort of public thing a uh, year or so ago with um, making a big deal about one alley and activating that alley. But alleys are really important to allow people to ride their bikes or walk where they're not on streets full of cars. And um, so you're looking at vacating yet another city owned alley here and with no plan, no forethought, no, no way, no understanding as to how this fits in the bigger picture. And this particular alley, um, it may be worth vacating, it may not be, but you have no plan and no criteria for why you're vacating that. Um, and then the second things are with Main Street and Kensington. Main Street was just redone uh, with a road diet, new bike lanes, uh, and is going to get redone again uh, in the not too distant future when the city has enough money to tear up the street and put new sewers in and such. And so if you're talking about uh, building with no setbacks, that's going to hurt the walkability and bikeability of the corridor. Same goes for the Kensington Street, um, which is a neighborhood byway, which is getting redone as a neighborhood byway, and this borders on Kensington. And does this plan even fit in at all with either of these two uh, transportation, active transportation streets? Um, I don't think so, so thank you. That was the final registered commenter. Thank you, Taylor, and thank you for all the comments from our residents. I will look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the council close the public hearing and defer action to a future council meeting. Second. I have a motion from, any discussion on this motion? Seeing no discussion, a roll call is Councilmember Fowler. Yes. Wharton. Yes. Bella Morris. Yes. Mono. Yeah. Pui. Yes. And I think Mono is just probably not uh, hearing us. So that motion passes five to zero with Councilmember Mono and uh, Pizza Russia absent. Mm -hmm. Moving on to item number. B2, budget amendment number four for fiscal year 2022 to 23. And before we take any comments, I'll have turn the time over to Ben Lucky from the Council Analyst Office. Budget amendment number four has 37 individual items with expenditures totaling over $122 million. Some of the largest items 
include $67 million for a recently issued sales tax revenue bond to make investments in city-owned historic properties and critical infrastructure. There's $23 million for the last issuance of the voter-approved 2018 streets reconstruction bond. An additional $5 million from the US Treasury for emergency rental assistance. And renters can apply for that at rentrelief.utah.gov. There's also $4.8 million for police department overtime, which is found in four separate items, and $750,000 to renovate five fire stations for gender equity improvements. The updated staff report, the updated transmittal from the administration, and several attachments are all in today's meeting packet. The council's budget webpage is tinyurl.com forward slash SLCFY23. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And Taylor, please start our first public comment. Thank you, Council Chair. It looks like there is no one here to speak to this item. Well, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Count Chair, I move that the Council close the public hearing and refer the item to a future date for action. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Fowler, second from Councilmember Valdemar. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion, I will roll call. Councilmember Pui? Yes. Mano? Yes. Valdemar? Yes. Orton? Fowler? Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes six to zero with Councilmember Peter Asher absent. Moving on to item. Item number C, potential actions. We have none. Comments? Any questions for the mayor? No, no questions for the mayor? Hold, please. Hold, please. Sorry, Mr. Chair. No Moving on to item D2, comments to the council. We are now at our comment portion of our agenda and we'll hear comments on general topics and items not scheduled for a hearing tonight. I went over the city council's rules of decorum earlier and those rules apply here as well. We are accepting comments in person or are online via WebEx. Isaac is a... Uh, on our staff is moderating the meeting and will message attendees as needed. Taylor Hill on our staff can, will call out names for those who wish to comment based on the order of resi uh, registration or received comment cards. And once we open public comments, Taylor will announce three names at the time uh, so that people can have some notice to prepare for speak. And, uh, at the two, and I'm not going to read the rest of it because I think we've just went over that. So Taylor, you can begin our first uh, general comment. Thank you, Council Chair. It looks like there is one person registered for general comment, and that is Dave Iltis, who is here in person to speak. Hi, my name is Dave Iltis. Um, I came tonight to talk to you about the death of the little girl that happened um, Wednesday, November 30th on 13th South and 21st East. Um, she was hit and killed in a crosswalk by an errant driver who wasn't under the influence or anything. Um, he's apparently very broken up and his life will probably be destroyed. The um, person I interviewed about this said that they've never seen so much blood come from a little girl. What is the council and the mayor going to do about this? Enough, when's enough enough? When is one more death enough. What are you guys going to do? You guys ignored the complete street on 100 South, so that was an incredible failure by both the mayor, transportation division, and this council. I'm asking you to read the email I sent you, the editorial I sent you, to adopt Vision Zero. 
Vision Zero is a commitment by the city that we will have do everything possible to have no more traffic deaths or serious injuries ever again in Salt Lake. This year, um, we've had approximately 21 or 22 deaths uh, in the city from traffic accidents. And a number of these are bicyclists and pedestrians, vulnerable road users, um, and people in automobiles. And people in Salt Lake City drive too fast. Um, we don't have, we, we have a traffic calming program that is going to do great things, but it's not instituted yet. We had this happen in May, and the mayor and head of UDOT instituted a task force called, um, kind of anemically, the Safe Streets Task Force. Rename that to Vision Zero Task Force. Fund safety measures, and please do something. Please don't sit there and ignore this. We, we can't afford to do this anymore for the safety of everybody, including the kids. Thanks. Thank you. That was the final registered commenter. Thank you for the comments and thank you, Taylor. Moving on to item number E, new business. This brings us to new business item number E1, establishing limits for new water availability. I will look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the council adopt the ordinance. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Fowler, a second from Councilmember Valdemoros. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion on this item, I will roll call us. Councilmember Pui? Yes. Mono? Yes. Valdemoros? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Fowler? Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes unanimously with Councilmember Pizzo absent. Moving on to item number F, unfinished business, F1. A resolution amending an interlocal agreement between Sandy and Salt Lake City regarding computer aided dispatch and record management system services. I look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the council approve a resolution amending an interlocal agreement between Salt Lake City and Sandy City for 911 and related services. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Fowler, a second from Councilmember Valdemoros. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no discussion, I will roll call it Councilman Valdemoros. Yes. Wharton? Yes. Fowler? Yes. Mono? Yes. Pui? Yes. And that motion passes six to zero. Moving on to item number F2, an ordinance on economic development loan fund, Club Verse at 609 South State Street. Mr. Chair? Yes. I move that the council adopt the ordinance approving a $250,000 loan for Club Burrs for Economic Development Loan Fund. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Puglia, second from Council Member Wharton. Any discussion on this item? See no discussions, I will roll call it Council Member Puglia. Yes. Mano? Father Morris? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Fowler? Yes. Mano? Yes. And I'm a yes that passes uh, six to zero. With council member Pete Thrasher absent, we will move on to item number G, consent agenda. And this brings us to section G, consent agenda of our portion of our agenda. I look for a motion. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion for council member Wharton, a second from council member Fowler. Any discussion on these items? No discussions, I will roll call it council member Yes. Mono. Yes. Father Morris? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Fowler? Yes. And I'm a yes that passes uh, six to zero was Councilman Peter Usher absent. And that, I believe, concludes our formal session. We are adjourned. If I would remember our gavel, I'd slam it. It's right back here. <laughs>